All right, hello everybody. And welcome to the third keynote uh, talk in Black Box. Uh, we're very happy to have uh, Idan Blank here. Idan is now an assistant uh, professor of psychology in UCLA. Before that, he did his postdoc and before that his PhD at MIT. Um, and he's been uh, doing some very interesting cycling, um, very interesting neurolinguistic research, um, looking in into how language is uh, processed and uh, represented uh, in our brain. And uh, I think Idan also has some very uh, interesting takes on natural language processing and what we could learn from neuroscience about uh, NLP and perhaps from NLP about uh, neuroscience. And hopefully we'll hear some of that uh, today. So thank you so much for, uh, for coming, uh, Idan, and uh, take it up. All right. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes. Perfect. All right. So uh, thank you very much for inviting me to talk to you. And I'm sorry I can't be there to meet all that we all can't be there to meet each other in person. Um, the main question I'd like to discuss today is what, uh, whoops, what does success in NLP look like? And I'll address it in two complementary parts. And so the first part, I call it, what was the question? And my main goal in this part is to convince you that hopefully that when we are trying to answer what does success in NLP look like, um, some attempts to answer, answer this question uh, deeply misconstrue it in, in uh, important ways. And to support this argument, I'll review a lot of evidence regarding what we know about human language and specifically evidence from cognitive neuroscience. Now, my own work is situated in this domain, but most of it is not the kind that would support my argument most strongly because it's a little more involved. So I've decided to take some liberties and, and provide you in the first part with a selective overview of studies by my colleagues. And I think those are the studies that best illustrate the claims I'll be trying to make. So first, I'd like to acknowledge the people who actually did the work I'll be reviewing in this first part. Um, and so Ev Fedorenko from MIT was my PhD and postdoc advisor, and she's a close collaborator, Rosemary Varley at UCL, and Martin Monti at UCLA, and of course, all of their students and mentees are responsible for the very cool data I'll be sharing with you. And I'll try my, my best to, to be their ambassador. So what I'm, I'm doing is um, I'll try to convey some lessons about language from the field of cognitive neuroscience in a way that I think is relevant to the NLP community. All right. So what does NLP success look like? Um, well, minimally, we want a system that models the statistical distribution of linguistic input, and perhaps also implicitly infers some structural rules that approximate uh, these statistical uh, dis distributional properties. Um, and also a system that uses all of this information productively. So that's sort of the minimal requirements. Now, what does it mean to use it productively? Well, there are many attempts to interpret that as meaning that the system should use language to think uh, in some way or another. So to present the kind of reasoning or inference or common sense that humans have. Um, and so when people are asking whether BERT or GPT-3, for example, are good at NLP, um, I'm going to show you some tasks that they say that we should use. So for example, arithmetic tasks. So for example, from Gary Marcus, if I put 15 trophies on a shelf, I sell five. Um, and add a new one, how many do I have? Leaving a total of how many? Or when counting, what number comes before 10,000? Um, so these kinds of questions that you can pose to these systems and see what they say. Or questions about spatial reasoning and understanding what is where. So here's an example. Yesterday I dropped my clothes off at the dry cleaners uh, and have yet to pick them up. Where are my clothes? Or you want to get to an island, the only bridge is through Newport, you'll pass through Somerset. If you find yourself in Gloucester, that's the place with the huge Masonic Lodge, then you've gone too far. So you set out on your way and you stop paying attention. And then suddenly in front of you is a building with a sign, Order of the Masons Lodge 575. So you are where? Um, other tests are tests of mentalizing or social cognition. So inferences about other people's mental states and how they relate to behavior. For example, a cat was sitting next to a mouse hole in the kitchen wall waiting for the mouse, but he was too cautious. So what would the mouse do? What would the cat think or do? 
Um, Chloe and Alexander went for a walk. They both saw a dog in a tree. Alexander saw, also saw a cat and pointed it out to Chloe. She went to pet the cat. Chloe was not, and then, you know, what would the machine say Chloe thinks or believes or desires? Um, also tests of logical inferences. So for example, this is the famous entailment task. So you see a sentence like a soccer game with multiple male, uh, males playing, and then some men are playing a sport. And the question is whether the second sentence was entailed uh, by the first one or whether it contradicts it or neutral with respect to it. Or you can give a network sentences like a robin is a versus a robin is not a and see how the network completes both of these. Also computer programming. So using these networks to generate computer code, for example, write one line of Ruby code to reverse an array. Um, tracking long narratives. So I'm not going to read this, but here's an example of one thing that Gary Marcus um, gives GPT-3 to see how it continues it, which of course requires tracking this very, very long chunk of text. Uh, understanding cause and effect. So for example, what are two reasons that a dog might be in a bad mood? Or you need flour to bake bread. You have a sack of flour in the garage. Um, and when you get there, you find that it got thoroughly soaked in a heavy rain last night. So you have to, what, what's the result? Um, what are the effects of, the, of this rain? Also more general tests of world knowledge. So for example, at the zoo, my sister asked if they painted the black and white stripes on the animal. I explained to her that they were natural features of a, we're asking the network if it knows what a zebra is, um, which is heavier, a toaster or a pencil. How many eyes does a foot have? Um, if the sky is the sea, what does that make birds? And so on. And also tests of thematic roles. So understanding who did what to whom. For example, giving a network two sentences, the restaurant owner forgot which customer the waitress had something, or the restaurant owner forgot which waitress the customer had something, and seeing whether the network treats these two things differently. Um, and so uh, with these kinds of probes, there's been a lot of hype claiming that BERT or GPT-2 fail miserably on these tasks. Um, so for example, this uh, piece by Gary Marcus and Ernst Davis, um, and so these critiques say that if NLP systems fail on these tasks, then they are not good language models. So they don't know meaning in the same way that humans do, um, an argument that is also made by, uh, by this paper and by this paper, or maybe they don't have sufficiently rich contexts to use language the way humans do. Um, but I wanna say, wait a second, what was the question? What were we trying to ask when we set out to use these tests? And what we wanted to answer was whether BERT and GPT-3 or other networks are good at natural language processing specifically. Uh, and so the question is, do these tests measure natural language processing or not? So what does NLP success look like? How do we measure whether a system is good at NLP? One, one thing we could test is whether the network um, can use language comp competently. Uh, another alternative is to test it as a general AI system. Now, hopefully you agree with me that a general AI system, that kind of test for language models is just a non-starter. Um, we wouldn't expect intelligence to just fall out from linguistic input alone without grounding, without employing representational formats that work well in other domains like vision or motor learning, stuff like that, right? And people don't usually test NLP models on, on something like object classification because that is part of visual intelligence, not language knowledge. And so we want to test whether network or whether our systems are competent language users. And we have two ways of doing that. One is to take inspiration from what success looks like in human minds in terms of language. And another is to use evaluation criteria independent of what we know about human minds. And if we do take inspiration from human minds, then we want to measure language qua language. So we want to take a task that human minds solve with linguistic representations and processes, um, not tasks that are solved otherwise. But if we use evaluation criteria independently of what we know about human minds, then we might take a task that is communicated by language, a task that you can encode in verbal instructions, but that the human mind solves via non-linguistic representations and processes. And of course, once you do that, you end up testing whether your system is a general AI system because you're using a task that is not actually a linguistic task, even though it can be encoded in verbal instructions. And so this is not something I think we should want to do. But a lot of the hype and the, and the, the current work associated with that hype, um, I think is happening here. And I think this is deeply misguided. 
And I think this results for some confusion about the relationship between language and cognition. And so there is an implicit view that language and cognition are strongly intertwined, that they are in a sense inseparable. So if you think of cognition as kind of blue and language is kind of red, they go together. So maybe at the very edge up here in blue, we can find cognitive processes that we are certain are unrelated to language like motor learning. Um, and maybe at the very edge down here in red, we can find processes that we are certain beyond a shadow of a doubt are at the heart of language. But most of cognition is fuzzy and it's sort of in between where cognition and language go hand in hand. And I would like to argue that this is not the, cat, the case. There is a lot of research focused on delineating the borders between language and the rest of cognition. And we can get more and more accurate about what these borders are. And the emerging picture, I believe, looks more like this. Uh, so the borders may be inherently fuzzy, but they are far, far less fuzzy than what is implicitly assumed by a lot of work that I see in NLP. Um, okay, so how do we separate the two? Um, so, so I want to claim that there are some things we are pretty sure are language proper, and you would probably, I hope, agree with me about those. But importantly, there are other things we are pretty sure are not language, and this is what I hope to convince you today. Um, and so how do, we, how do we delineate these borders? I would like to make uh, one proposal. And so I'd like to introduce you to a set of brain regions that I refer to as the core language network. Um, this is a set of brain regions in the frontal and temporal lobe. They're lateralized to the left hemisphere. Um, and so here's an example of these regions in one brain of one individual. Um, here are examples of those regions in other brains. They are all sort of the, the brain anatomically is the same template or standard brain. But onto this brain, I project activations of individual people. So you can see that these regions don't fall exactly in the same place across people, but the overall topography is very, very similar. Um, and these regions are reliably and robustly engaged in language processing. So across reading, listening, and sign, um, these regions increase their activity when you process language. Across many stimuli and tasks, across both comprehension and production, um, and they engage in what I call high level language processing. And by that, I mean that they are separate from other brain regions that are spatial, specialized only for speech and other brain regions that are specialized only for visually recognizing letters. They're also separate from regions that are specifically engaged in articulation. Um, these regions are very sensitive to phonology, to word meaning and, and morphosyntax and to combinatorial syntax and semantics. Um, and the main thing that seems to drive them is sort of uh, the, the meaningfulness of an utterance or a stimulus. So the more linguistically meaningful a stimulus is, the stronger the response in this network. It has a causal link to language abilities. So if you suffer damage to this network specifically, you have aphasia or language disorders. Um, and importantly, this network is a natural kind. So what I mean by that is that you can put people in the fMRI scanner and just tell them to mind wander for five minutes. And you record their brain activity when they do that. So in each brain region, activity just fluctuates up and down as you do that. And then you can use a data-driven analysis to parcelate the whole brain into different sets of regions that are strongly synchronized amongst themselves, but less synchronized with the rest of the brain. And one of the sets you get in this way, in this purely data-driven way, is the core language network. So it falls out naturally from how the brain is functionally organized. This is a set of regions that are regions that are very internally synchronized with one another, but not so synchronized with the rest of the brain. And so one working hypothesis is that language is whatever uh, this network does. And of course, we don't have a complete answer of what this network does, but we know that it does some things like those things that I mentioned. And we also know that it doesn't do other things. Um, and so two examples uh, or three examples of many is that this network stores linguistic rules, including vocabulary, um, it establishes dependencies, so syntactic parsing, or it's, it uh, engages in semantic composition. Um, also, it engages in prediction based both on, on linear sequences of words, so things like engrams, um, and hierarchical uh, sort of tree structures. All right. Um, and one thing we can do to understand language proper is to home in on what language is by excluding what it is not. And this is what I'm going to try and do. So. Um, Two ways to do this is to look at processes for which language is not necessary. And the way we do this is we look at things that people with post-stroke global aphasia can do. So global aphasia is uh, a disorder that, are, that is, a, is such a severe linguistic deficit that at best, it spares nothing but single word comprehension. So these people are very bad at producing words and they're terrible at any kind of grammar beyond the single word level. 
Um, so pretty much their whole language network is wiped out by a massive stroke. And you can look at what things they can do, and whatever it is that they can do um, are processes for which language is not necessary, right? Because these people don't have language. We can also look at processes that do not recruit the, the core language network in typical circumstances. And for that, we can use fMRI data of the core language network in neurotypical adults and ask if you didn't have a stroke and if you're just engaging in some cognitive processes, do these cognitive processes um, recruit core language regions? So let's start with arithmetic, um, whether it's necess it necessarily requires language. So this is a study that looked at people with global aphasia and whether they can do the sort of four basic arithmetic operations, also whether they can add and subtract uh, uh, fractions, if they can do novel multiplications that are not memorized, if they understand reversible operations so that two minus five is not five minus two, if they understand infinity and if they understand uh, hierarchical order of operations, and I'm gonna show you the percent correct of these patients. There are about three patients. Um, you can see that they are very, very good at this. So arithmetic um, doesn't necessarily require language. You can do it without language. What about spatial cognition? Um, so first I'm gonna show you results from control participants that I'm gonna share with the patients. Um, in a baseline task of spatial cognition, a person is in a rectangular room that has four containers each in every corner and they see an object and they see this object being hidden in one of the corners and then you blindfold this person and you uh, rotate them in the room and then they open their eyes and their goal is to reorient themselves and tell you in which container the object is hidden. And so these people unsurprisingly don't often look in these two corners, but maybe surprisingly, they also don't search a lot in this correct corner. And the reason is that they are confused between that one and the diagonally opposite corner, um, because this room has sort of no clue to distinguish these two corners. So their performance is actually not significantly above chance. Chance is 25%, given that there are four corners, and they don't perform significantly above chance. In a landmark condition, you do the same task, except now one of the walls is colored, and so that landmark should help you reorient yourself. And when you do that, again, people don't look in these two corners, um, but they also don't look in the opposite, uh, diagonally opposite corner. They mostly look in the correct corner. Um, and so when you look at percent correct, and chance is 25%, this is what you see for control people. They're bad at the baseline task. They're very good at the landmark task. And people with global aphasia perform virtually the same. So uh, language is not necessary for spatial cognition. You can also look at mentalizing or social cognition. So whether these people can understand false beliefs. For example, you show them this book with an experimenter in the room. Let's say the experimenter is called Mike. And then Mike leaves the room. And when Mike is outside the room, you open the book and you show them it's actually a jewelry box. And then you ask them, what would Mike think is inside? Now, these people don't understand sentences. So this necessitates a lot of drawing and, and gesture and pantomime to ask them this. Um, but this is a patient who had very rudimentary ability to produce single words, so he wrote book. And then you ask them what is really inside, and he drew a necklace. Um, so this person understands that Mike can have a false belief about the world, which is an important property of social cognition. So social cognition doesn't necessarily require language. Then we can look at these three things, arithmetic, spatial, and social cognition, uh, and whether they typically recruit core language regions. So even if, even if language is not necessary, maybe it's still recruited in typical conditions for those processes. So for a math task, we scan adults while they'll do this. They have to add numbers and keep the result in mind. And then they have to choose which of two results are the right one. In a spatial working memory task, they see a grid of squares and they have to keep, uh, that squares start lighting up and they have to keep track of which squares light up um, over time. And then they have to tell us which of two options shows the squares they've just memorized. And in a work, in a mentalizing task, they watch a, a Pixar film and there are specific moments that involve inferences about the mental states of these characters. And so we can look at the percent signal change in core language regions. I'm gonna show you data from one region, but all language regions behave the same. Here is zero is the, the baseline, is the level of activity in these regions when you just stare at a blank screen. So we're going to see which processes cause these regions to fire more compared to when you're just staring at a blank screen. And so first we can look at reading sentences and these regions respond significantly to reading sentences much more than they respond to reading, for example, gibberish. They also respond very strongly when you listen auditorily to intact speech, but uh, not to acoustically degraded speech. Um, when you do the math task, either a hard version or an easier version, you get nothing. When you do the spatial memory task, either harder or easier, you get nothing. 
And when you look at moments in the movie that require mental state inference, you get nothing. Um, so you get for these processes, the same activity levels as when you're staring at a blank screen. So the language, core language regions really don't care about these things. All right. Um, what else? Humor. Whether humor typically requests, uh, recruits core language regions. So you can give people jokes, like she went on a 14 day diet, but all she lost was two weeks versus non-jokes. She went on a 14 day diet, but all she lost was two ounces. And you look at the percent signal change in core language regions. And in both cases, you see strong response, of course, because people are reading sentences, but importantly, there is no difference between the two conditions. And so the humor itself doesn't result in any additional activity beyond reading no, non-joke sentences. If the core language regions cared about humor, you would expect even stronger response uh, when you have to compute uh, things that are humorous. That was humor. What about logic and entailment? Uh, you can give people uh, logical statements like if both X and Z, then not Y. And then a second, uh, uh, it's like a, a conclusion of the premise, if Y, then either not X or not Z. And in an entailment task, they have to say whether the conclusion follows or not. And you compare that to a baseline task where they just have to say whether these statements are grammatical. So in an ungrammatical condition, you can say if Y, then either not and X, something like that. That's just is ungrammatical. Um, and you get slightly stronger response in these regions when you do entailment, but it's not significant. So compared to when you're just reading these and trying to decide whether they're grammatical, compare that to a case where you do uh, a language task that is very similar. So it was X that Y saw Z take. And then you see Z was seen by Y taking X. And you have to say whether the first entail the second or whether they sort of mean the same thing or a grammaticality judgment. And here you get a much bigger difference. Um, so when you have to compare two sentences for meaning, this network really uh, fires a lot. But when you just have to compute logical entailment, it really doesn't, it's not that active. All right, um, programming and code comprehension. You can give people a Python code like this, height is five, weight is 100, BMI is this formula, so what is your BMI? And then you give people a multiple choice to see if they understand this code. And you compare this to the same problem, but in language. So your height is five feet and your weight is 100 pounds. The BMI is defined as the ratio between the weight and the square of the height, what's your BMI? And again, you look at percent signal change relative to baseline in core language regions. And um, you get stronger response when you solve the same problem in language and weaker response when you solve the same problem in code. Um, so weaker response when the problem is in code, suggesting that these regions are not strongly involved in code comprehension. But still, when you're reading code, the response is stronger than when you're reading gibberish. So there is something there. So to really nail this, um, Anya, who ran the study, looked at code in a different programming language that is visual and is meant for children. So you see this kind of code representation and your task is to say whether a video corresponds to the code or implements the code. And you can do the same in language. Kid, uh, kitten walks to the right, bumps dog, which makes dog spin in a circle. In the meantime, kitten walks back to the left and then they see the video and have to say if it's the same or not. And in this case, um, you get again, stronger responses for language than for code. And now the response to code is as strong as the response when you're reading gibberish. So it really seems like the responses of this network to code comprehension are both weak and inconsistent across different coding languages, suggesting that code comprehension doesn't typically recruit these regions. Then you can look at tracking multi-sentence narratives. Um, so you can play people a reverse audio of a story that doesn't sound like anything, or a list of words that are unconnected to one another, or a list of sentences, or a list of paragraphs, or a full intact story. And look at how strongly these regions track the incoming stimulus. And what you see is they track reverse audio very weakly. Basically, they don't track it because it's meaningless. They track lists of words significantly more. And they track lists of sen sentences significantly more than they track lists of words. But when you get to full paragraphs, they don't care about it more than they care about sentences. So sentences that don't connect to one another drive this network as much as a full paragraph does. And an intact story doesn't do that either. So tracking doesn't increase further. There are, of course, other regions in the brain, not core language regions, that do exhibit stronger tracking of paragraphs and sentences. So of course, we can integrate narratives. It's not just not the job of this system. All right, and uh, world knowledge cause and effect. You can ask whether it necessarily requires language. So you can look at uh, global aphasics and you show them this event and you ask them what's the likely cause. In this case, the answer is alcohol. And you have two semantic associates of this uh, picture. 
they get a perfect score, or you can tell them event or describe it with pantomime events and ask them to generate hypoth hypothetical causes. Um, so when you give them a house fire, they say, well, maybe it was a wiring fault or arson or a cigarette. You can even show them um, implausible events like a bullet deflecting off a buffalo. And they say, well, maybe it was a toy gun. Maybe there was a strong tail movement. Maybe it was a dream. All right. Um, and in general, um, I want to mention that one of these patients of, with global aphasia could not make grammaticality judgments, couldn't comprehend simple active sentences, couldn't access verb semantics, couldn't produce more than article noun or adjective noun word pairs, so really didn't have uh, any language left. But he could drive, play chess and strategy games, and manage family finances. So clearly, you don't need language for word knowledge. Um, the case where it gets a little more key is thematic role labeling. So with global aphasia, you can show them a picture and ask them whether this is a plausible event of a cop arresting a criminal or whether a criminal arresting a cop is a plausible event, and they can do it. So you, uh, language is not necessary for thematic role labeling. But when you do the same in fMRI with a picture that people either have to say if it's plausible or not, or to make a perceptual judgment of whether the picture is moving to the left or to the right on the screen, um, you can compare that to a language task where they see a sentence like the criminal arresting the cop and either make a plausibility judgment or the sentence moves on the screen. And the language re uh, network responds more when you judge the plausibility of a sentence than when you just perceptually look at whether it's moving to the left or to the right. But you get a similar pattern when you judge the plausibility of pictures. Um, overall across the network, picture plausibility um, results in activity that is about half the size of sentence plausibility. So sentences still drive this network more but it's there, it's non-zero when you judge the plausibility of these events. So thematic role labeling, understanding who did what to whom, uh, typically recruits these language regions, even though they're not required for, for that influence. So what I showed you is that arithmetic, spatial reasoning, social cognition, humor, logic, code comprehension, causality, narratives, and world knowledge are not language. They are separable from language. Um, thematic roles might be somewhere on the border. We're not sure yet. There are other cases I haven't shown you, like music, communicative gestures, action observation, and intuitive physics that also don't recruit language regions and aren't required for language. Um, now, I want to mention that you know people say, well, what about meaning? World knowledge is meaning, and, and intuitive physics is meaning, and social cognition is meaning. So what the language network, the core language network might have is sort of ungrounded knowledge of language. Um, but this, this might be what language proper is. So whatever meaning you can get via ungrounded language, like meaning based on word similarities or collocation patterns, that meaning would be stored in the core language regions. And whatever processes this, this kind of meaning is enough for, then the language network could do, whatever processes rely on other world, grounded world knowledge, um, that's not the job of this network. That happens elsewhere, and that's not part of language. Um, quick aside, what this does not uh, entail, so the fact that we have regions in our brain that are very, very language specific doesn't mean that they're innate. So we know from other studies that you can get very domain specific brain regions through training or through development. It also doesn't mean that language processing is encapsulated. That's very important. We know that language processing is opportunistic and it uses whatever information sources are available as soon as they're available. Um, so it's not like core language regions are isolated. They do communicate with the rest of the brain. Um, but those other sources of knowledge are processed by those other parts of the brain. All right, um, so what does NLP success look like? Uh, well, I wanted to convince you that not every task for which input can be expressed in language counts as a language task. And testing NLP systems on abilities that in the human mind are strongly dissociated from linguistic abilities is a misguided enterprise. So if the NLP system fails on say arithmetic, you cannot infer fault at processing language because it's not a language task. And if it succeeds at doing arithmetic, then it answers the wrong question. What it tells you is that it gives you a proof of principle that large amounts of language without other forms of information suffice for learning some types of world knowledge or common sense. Um, and this is akin to uh, working congenitally blind individuals that for example, shows that they know uh, something about color words and they know a lot about the detailed meanings of different verbs related to sight and seeing, even though they've never seen anything in their life. And one hypothesis is that they learn this from how these words are used in language. All right, so how do we augment our tests of success in language qua language? Uh, I'm gonna do this very, very quickly. 
Um, one way I think we can add more to our tests of, of artificial neural networks is what uh, we call integrative benchmarking. And this is work led by Martin uh, Schrimpf at MIT in collaboration with all these wonderful people. Um, and the idea of inter in, uh, integrative benchmarking is that it provides another measure of success. Um, and we ask whether neural networks capture something about linguistic computations in the brain. And so the idea is that you specify a set of behaviors that together define some domain of intelligence, in our case, language, and you assemble neural and behavioral data from across this domain in order to guide and constrain neurally mechanistic models that are capable of generating that set of behaviors. And so the idea is that we're going to use multiple data sets for testing and comparing many models. All models must be sentence computable, so um, you should be able to get a presentation of any sentence with these artificial models. The basic components are always going to be sort of integrated fire neurons and the connections between them, um, and no further qualifications on simplicity of the neural networks or their interpretability. And so we're going to ask whether language networks are brain-like. Um, and so specifically, I'll ask how reliably they predict the brain's activity during language comprehension, and do they predict reading behavior? And I'll briefly ask whether different, that if it's the case that different artificial neural networks show different predictivity, then what characteristics differentiate the better models from the worst one? And so the idea is that we take some language stimulus, this is our bench, uh, benchmarking data set, and we give it to the human mind and get neural or behavioral responses. We give the same stimuli to an artificial mind or an artificial neural network, and we measure the neural response, which is just the unit activations, and then we compute a similarity score, or we test whether the neural, uh, the unit activations can predict uh, brain or behavioral data. So we use four benchmarking data sets. One is called sentences. It's from fMRI, people reading about 600 sentences that come from different paragraphs. This is the data set that has the best signal to nose ratio. So I'm gonna show you most of the results from there. Sentences are presented visually and we measure the mean fMRI signal per sentence. So not every word, but the sentence as a whole from each language voxel in the language network. Voxel is the smallest unit that we can measure with fMRI. The word by word data set is a data set from ECOG. That's uh, these, uh, this measure comes from electrodes that are placed directly on the surface of the brain. This happens in patients with intractable epilepsy. Um, they read 50 sentences presented word by word visually, and we compute the mean power of some electric signals per word. So here we have signals per word in each language electrode. Another data set is fMRI data set where people listen to eight naturalistic stories, each about five minutes long. Those are presented auditorily. And our signal is the mean fMRI signal per two second fragment of the story. So that two second might be half of a sentence or two sentences or something like that. And here we look at the activity in a, a whole language region. We have a behavioral data set of self-paced reading times in the same set of naturalistic stories that were presented, of course, visually word by word. We, we measure the reading time per word. So um, we have data sets with different ways of measuring brain activity and behavior, different grains of linguistic units, right? Words or sentences or two second fragments um, and visual and auditory. And we compared 43 artificial neural networks, some word embeddings, some recurrent neural networks uh, like skip thoughts and many, many transformers. So how do we compute a similarity score? Let's say we take the sentences and we measure the brain of someone reading a sentence. And let's say we look at this voxel. Voxels are usually much, much smaller, but let's say that this is the unit, the green one that we record from. And we look at how active this unit is during the first sentence and how active it is during the second sentence. And stronger colors say that this chunk of the brain is more active. Um, and so it's less active in the third sentence. It's really active in the fourth sentence and so on. And we split our data to 80% and 20%. We give the same sentence um, to a neural network, uh, to all the layers, and so on. And then we take one layer, we repeat this. I, I'm, I'm showing you the results of the best performing layer. It's different in, for each artificial network. We take the unit activations to the first sentence and to the second sentence and to all the other sentences. Um, and then we just do regression. So we're trying to predict 80% of the brain data um, from 80% of the unit activations or activations for 80% of the sentences. And then on a held out 20%, we use these same uh, coefficients that we found and we just measure the correlation um, between the actual brain data and the predicted brain data. So how reliably can we predict the brain data? Um, I'm gonna show you results for the sentence database. Predictivity is gonna be on the y-axis. 
um, it's going to be normalized. So one doesn't mean a correlation of one with the brain. It's, uh, we, we use reliability as an upper bound. So uh, we measure how well we could hope to predict brain data for one person uh, based on the brain data of other people. Um, and so we compute that correlation, the correlation between activity in one brain and all of the other brains. And that is the, as high as we can hope to get. And so in this case, the ceiling is actually 0.31. So a, a predictability or a predict, predictivity score of one means that the correlation between neural networks and the brain is 0.31. Um, and here are embedding models, not very good. Recurrent networks do better. Um, Bidirectional transformers do really, really well. And with GPT-2 extra large, we actually capture all the variants that we can possibly hope to capture given the noise in fMRI data. Um, so yeah, it predicts as much as we could hope, we could hope to, um, which I think is really surprising. So here's another way to measure whether these are good NLP systems. Uh, for the ECOG data set where we have data per word and not per sentence, um, we also get pretty close to the ceiling. And for the story data sets, uh, where we have data for each two second fragment of the story, all models do fairly poorly. Um, I think this is because the modeling that we did was not ideal. We're now trying to model it in a, in a different way. Um, and interestingly, overall models that predict one data set better versus worse also predict other data sets better. So GPT models are better overall for all three models. Um, and so the correlation, if you look across models, the correlation in how well they predict one data set versus another data set is 0.5 to 0.6. Um, you also can look at uh, how well we can predict self-paced reading times per word. And here too, we do really, really well and capture all the variants that there is to capture. Transformers predict reading behavior extremely accurately. So for example, Albert X or extra large. Skip thought models, which is this grade line, uh, predict very, very well as well. Um, and then you can correlate brain and behavior productivity. So here, I'll show you neural productivity on the x-axis and behavior productivity on the y-axis. And each dot is going to be a network. Um, and we get a very strong correlation. So network, networks that predict the brain well also predict behavior well. So unidirectional transformers capture about 100% of the explainable variance. And predictivity is generalizable. So better models are better across modalities and grains of linguistic units and measures of brain activity. And better brain productivity is accompanied by better behavioral productivity. Now, given that these different models show different levels of productivity, what, what determines that? So does productivity co-vary with any performance on an NLP task? And how important is the architecture versus the training? So I'll show this really quickly. We take a bunch of tasks, and for each task, we train a decoder from the final layer of a neural network. So the neural network itself is fixed because we use it to predict brain data. But we, we, what we train is a decoder from the final layer. And so here, I'll show you on the y-axis neural productivity, and on the x-axis next word prediction. So uh, it's perplexity, but it's sort of inverse perplexity, where worse is on the left and better prediction is on the right. And we get a correlation. So neural networks that predict text um, better also predict the brain better. And this suggests that the core language network and language models are optimized for a common goal, which is prediction. And this is pretty striking. It suggests that if you um, train a model to predict text, you sort of get that model's ability to predict the brain for free. Um, and then we also looked at all the glue tasks. Here I'm showing you the average, and there is no correlation. So it's not that models that do well on any task predict the brain well. It's models that do well on prediction predict the brain well. Um, and so also this, this holds for every separate glue task that we tried. None of them correlates with brain productivity. So more brain-like models are better at next word prediction and selectively so. It doesn't work for other tasks, suggesting that there is common optimization of the brain in artificial neural networks for predictive processing. Finally, I want to show you findings about architecture versus training. So we tried predicting brain data with no training of the network. So we take the random weights, just, you know, we have the architecture that we have without training and we see how well we can predict the brain. And then we compare it to how well we can predict the brain after we train these networks. Um, all right, and what we get is a very strong correlation. So networks that predict the brain well before training also predict it well after training. Training generally proves the scores by 26%. Um, but for example, GPT-2 or Albert in an untrained version, do better than uh, BERT after training. Um, and it's not just about size. So random embeddings, like a, a word embedding, 
that has the same size as GPT-2XL has worse neural productivity than an untrained GPT-2XL. So it's not just that the models that do better have more units, and that's why they're better to predict the brain well. I find this very, very striking that we can predict the brain up to a productivity score of 0.8, even without any training and random weights. And so the conclusion here is that productivity of untrained models correlates with their productivity post-training, suggesting that architecture is at least as important as training. So this is where I'll end, and hopefully I've given you some new perspectives to think about what does it mean uh, to have success at, in NLP. Thank you very much. Um, we have uh, about five minutes for questions, and uh, I hope there will be some interesting discussion because part of our goal in Black Box is to bring a new perspective from other fields, in particular um, neuroscience. So uh, please type your questions over chat if you uh, can, and uh, we will answer. Thank you, Jake. Um, maybe I can start us off, um, uh, Idan. Um, I have a question about your um, assumption that we shouldn't test for uh, general intelligence. Uh, so, so I think many people are in NLP and in computer science are motivated by the Turing tests, namely that we don't have any better test for uh, intelligence than language communication. So is it really a false things to, to, to go for? Good question. Um, well, from, from the, I mean, I love the Turing test, but from these data, it seems it's, it's a very problematic test because knowing language does not mean knowing about the world, right? And so these neural networks are surprisingly good at language, not just in the sense that they capture the brain, right? They are very good at predicting texts. Um, they know a lot about syntax. They know a lot about word collocations. Um, they learn a lot about, you know, things that we, we didn't think you could learn in an unsupervised way. So they capture a lot of stru structural regularities. Um, and that is not the same as common sense reasoning. And so um, it would be great to use the Turing test once we have a model of general intelligence, right? So a model that has a component that is a neural language network, but also have other components that represent our intuitive theories of psychology and sociology and physics and capture other kinds of world knowledge and have you know, know, know what things look like and what things feel like and all of those things. And once we have that system that has a lot of components that interact, then a Turing test would be great. Um, and we can use the language modal, uh, module of that network to, to run the Turing test. Um, but I think the idea of a Turing test on something like GPT-3 is, is a little bit of a non-starter because it's, it's very non-surprising given what we know about the human brain, that these systems are very bad at, at, at common sense reasoning and, and world knowledge and inferences that have nothing to do with language proper. Okay, we have a bunch of questions. Uh, maybe I'll read them off uh, in the interest of the recording. Uh, so we have a question. How do we measure how good models are at prediction? I thought we couldn't compare perplexity between models with different vocabularies. Right, so by the way, the, the QR code here is for the paper that is currently on, on an archive, so you can see all the details here. Um, we tokenized the Wikitext 2 corpus to the best of our ability so that it would have maximal vocabulary for each of the networks. Um, and so, so to that extent, you know, that, the, that comparison across models is valid or invalid. Okay, there's a question here. Um, do you have any idea as to what sorts of representations in untrained models cause the high correlation with brain data? I have no idea. This is a great question. I think this is one of the next directions of, of this work. Um, so, so things you can do is you can lesion layers or lesion units or lesion specific patterns of connections um, or eliminate them from the network and then see what affects whether you can uh, predict brain activity or not, even without any training. And so this study, you know, we just took off the shelf network. So there are no minimal pairs of networks that only differ in terms of one feature. And so it's very hard to tell what it is exactly that allow these, the networks that do predict the brain before training to do so. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a fascinating question. 
Okay, uh, one more question, then I think we'll have to end. Uh, is this network also associated with language production? If I recall correctly, the tasks you mentioned were all perception. Uh, so yes, it is associated with production. Um, there, there is a lot of work on that too. I mostly work on comprehension, um, and we know less about production in part because when you produce things in fMRI, you move your mouth, which means you move your head, which means signals are terrible because head motion destroys fMRI data. Um, but we at least know that production engages this network very, very strongly. Okay, um, there are more questions, but unfortunately our time is up. Uh, and... Jonathan, we could go on for another five minutes. Because yeah, we have okay. Really yeah, well, you're running the next one, so if yeah. you don't mind. Yeah, and the, 20 minutes is just too much for Sure, so uh, let me read one more. Uh, on the slide on humor, you said fMRI doesn't show higher activations for the core language network than for regular sentences. Is reading sentences possibly an upper bound to activation of the CLN or does a task exist that activates it more than sentence reading? Um, that's a great question. So um, it doesn't seem to activate more when things are larger than sentences. Um, so if you give it paragraphs and stuff, it doesn't, you know, the fact that things are coherent at the level of a paragraph doesn't really uh, matter. But importantly, there are differences among different kinds of sentences. So in the experiment I showed you, the difference was that of humor and you, we didn't find any differences. But if you do subject extractions uh, or subject relative clauses versus object relative clauses, we know that object relative clauses are harder to process behaviorally and all regions of the core language network respond more to sentences that have object relative clauses compared to subject relative clauses. So it is possible to get differences across different kinds of sentences that involve different computations or place different demands. Um, it just doesn't seem to be the case for humor, but I agree that the, the ceiling effect is still somewhat of a concern. Okay, I'll read the next one. Does the distinctness of a language network in the brain suggest that in artificial general intelligence systems, there should be a distinct module highly connected to others that handles the same pure language tasks that the brain's language network does? Great question. Well, I mean, it depends on who you ask. If you ask me, I would say that this is probably a good way to go because the best system we have for general intelligence is the brain. And so it, it might be a good idea to try to take inspiration from how the brain solves it. And the brain solves many tasks with a divide and conquer um, approach where we have distinct mental toolbox for distinct processes. So for example, um, mental state inference and, and um, mentalizing and social cognition also have its own uh, set of regions that are separate from the rest of the brain. And so for that part as well, I would suggest that we need to have a module, maybe the module that counts, that processes our knowledge of, of intuitive psychology and the relationships between you know, beliefs and desires and behaviors. Um, other parts of the brain do many, many things together. So a lot of the tasks that I've shown you like arithmetic um, and logic uh, recruit a joint set of regions that are strongly related to IQ um, and, and fluid intelligence. And that set of regions sort of solves whatever it is we don't have another brain system for. Um, so whenever you're doing something artificial that your brain is not prepared to do, that system lights up. And the harder it is, the more it lights up. So harder arithmetic tasks activate that region more than that set of regions more than easy arithmetic tasks. And so that set of regions are sort of most closely related, I think, to what people think of when they think of AGI, because that set of regions is sort of where IQ happens or fluid intelligence happens. Um, but that set of regions doesn't have domain specific representations, right? It doesn't have the detailed linguistic knowledge or it doesn't have visual knowledge of what things look like or it doesn't have intuitive psychology knowledge. And so you somehow need to have those modules that can do general inference with those other modules that have more domain specific forms of knowledge. Yeah, there's a follow up here from Paul uh, on his own question. Um, Otherwise, why should researchers who really care about AGI care about NLP in your sense? Although I think given that the answer was basically yes, then th this is probably a non-issue, but uh, you can take it if you want. Uh, well, I mean, th that's a very good question. I mean, I, I think they should care about NLP to the extent that NLP is part of, of general intelligence in, in the sense that, um, you know, if you want to model all of cognition, language is a part of that. It's just one part of that, but it's a part of that. Plus, it seems for now that for AGIs, one of the best ways of measuring what the system knows is have it communicate with us. 
right? I mean, we can, we can build AGI systems that draw what they know or generate images, but it seems like people really like to talk to these networks. And so from that perspective, the language model is something you would need um, if, if you wanna use language, if you wanna the network to express what it knows via language. Um, and again, what it knows in non-linguistic domains can be expressed via language, right? We can talk about arithmetic and about logic and stuff. So in that sense, I think they, they that maybe that's why they care about NLT. Uh, okay, last question. Does the learning objective of language models play a role in how well the activations of the model predict brain neural activations? For example, predicting mass word as in BERT versus predicting the next word as in GPT. Um, so good question. I don't think we looked at it at this paper. Um, we just looked at prediction versus the glue tasks, like the, the sentiment analysis and the intelment and those things. Um, so in that sense, the learning objective uh, matter, matters. So, um, or well, it's not exactly that the learning objective, objective matters, it's that um, networks that, so all networks were trained on next word prediction in some way or mass word prediction, but networks whose representations allow you to actually do next word prediction, predict the brain better, and networks whose learn representations allow you to solve glue tasks in addition, those don't predict the brain better. Um, but I agree that learning objective and, and what exactly you're predicting is a very cool question. Um, and that's also one of the future directions, right? We can change the particular learning objective. Um, do, you, do you try to predict the specific form of the word? Do you try to predict something that just the, the part of speech that's, uh, that's upcoming? What are you trying to predict? And whether trying to predict different things causes or results in different brain predictivities. Okay. Thank you so much. There are more questions, but I think at this point uh, we should probably move on. So uh, let's uh, all thank you, Dan. I'm asking you to please unmute yourself and, uh, and join me in a clap. Thank you, everyone. And if you have questions, please feel free to email me or check out the papers. Um, 